So we're just uh, we're really grateful for all of you to be here, and we're really happy that Dr. William Hassan has been able to join uh, to uh, host this event for for us. And um, we're just going to uh, I'm just going to briefly introduce Dr. Maria Hassan, and then it will be over to Dr. Maria. Uh, the format of the forum would be uh, Dr. Maria will have a short presentation for about 20 minutes after which we will open the floor for discussion. You can write your questions in the chat box. Uh, we request you to mute yourselves for the duration of the talk so that there are, so that there are no issues. Uh, uh, yeah, all right. So uh, Dr. Mariam is a physician researcher working as a clinical research administrator at Dr. Khanna Memorial Cancer Hospital and Research Center a non-profit organization in, in Lahore, Pakistan, involved in state-of-the-art cancer treatment and research. The focus of her postgraduate education and training has been clinical trials, bioethics, and regulatory science. She holds a postgraduate diploma from CBET SIMT, and recently she has been invited as a WHO uh, as a panelist on the WHO consultation on COVID-19 therapeutics. So over to you, Dr. Mary. Thank you, Soleha, um, and I'm grateful to CBEC for inviting me to this forum today. Um, hello to all who have joined us today for this session. So um, without further ado, I think we'll start. So in the next 20 minutes or so, what we'll essentially do uh, is going to be like a COVID-19 vaccine 101 session of sorts. So I'll try and I quote, try uh, to keep my presentation brief. Uh, I'm not known to be brief um, as everyone at CVAC already knows, uh, but I'll try to be brief this time to enable Q&A and discussion at the end. So um, uh, let me also add that I have uh, kept the presentation today limited to the basics uh, that I feel are essential uh, to set the stage for our discussion later in the session today. So firstly, uh, Swale, if we could move to the outline slide. Great, thank you. So um, firstly, um, a little bit about, um, yeah, so, so a little bit about what we plan to cover. Uh, so we'll, we'll discuss what vaccines are and how they are developed routinely. And then what happens differently during vaccine development in a pandemic uh, and why is it done differently? The current uh, COVID-19 vaccine landscape and their approval process. And throughout this presentation, I will refer to um, areas that um, as people who will be vaccinating ourselves or have vaccinated ourselves recently or will be vaccinating ourselves in the near future, what information can you look out for before you decide to vaccinate yourself? Because I realize that with so much, uh, with the pandemic of misinformation throughout this pandemic, uh, and a similar uh, um, uh, thing has been noticed for vaccines as well, it is important that we equip ourselves with the right kind of information before we make decisions related to vaccination. So could we move on to the next slide, please? Okay, so firstly, what's a vaccine? How do they work? And what is the vaccination's role in achieving herd immunity? These are some of the uh, words that we have heard a lot in the past one year or so. So uh, our body has a natural uh, defense mechanism. Uh, it's called, um, next slide, please. So our body has a natural defense mechanism, uh, which is called our immune response uh, to various pathogens. Uh, and pathogens are essentially various kinds of germs. It can be viruses or bacteria. So when they uh, attack our body, uh, our body uh, generates a response, uh, a defense response, which is often called the immune response of the body. So um, Whenever a new uh, virus or bacteria enters our body, it uh, introduces a new antigen, which is the active part of a virus or a bacteria. And for every new antigen, our body needs to uh, build a specific response, which is called the specific antibody that you essentially need 
to combat that particular virus or a bacteria. So the vaccine is essentially a tiny weakened part of the virus or the you know non-dangerous part of a virus uh, that mimics the virus but does not cause disease in us. And it helps train our immune system, develop these antibodies that we need to uh, fight that disease without developing that particular disease. So next slide, please. So, um, so the vaccination uh, that we receive for various diseases, vaccination is not a concept that is new. Uh, we have been receiving vaccines for you know multiple decades, um, perhaps uh, almost a whole century now. Um, and um, it is important to get yourself vaccinated because when you are vaccinating yourself, you are not just protecting yourself, you are also protecting those around you because vaccinations also have the ability to enable us to stop transmitting that disease to others to a certain level. And because everyone in the community cannot be vaccinated for various reasons, sometimes uh, people don't have access to vaccines, but more so because um, uh, often people don't have the robust immune system that you need to receive a vaccine. For example, um, you know, those with HIV or other immune disorders or those with cancers, these are people who sometimes cannot receive vaccines. So we call them the vulnerable people in our population. And when they're surrounded by people who have received vaccines, they are also protected. So vaccines serve the dual purpose of protecting ourselves from developing that disease and to spread it to others, especially those who are most vulnerable to developing that disease. So, um, so with this, uh, we, we move on to understanding how a vaccine is developed. But before we uh, move towards this, it's important to understand that the vaccines that we receive do three important things. Firstly, they train our body to recognize the germ that, is, that we are being infected with. Secondly, they produce antibodies in response to those germs. But lastly and most importantly, they train our body to remember that particular virus or bacteria and to produce the same set of required antibodies whenever we'll be exposed to that, um, sometimes any time in our lives and sometimes you know we need booster doses we'll discuss that um, in the later part of our presentation so um, so vaccines usually only enable us to respond to that specific antigen to which we were exposed unless and until you know we we get exposed to uh, a kind of virus that is quite similar to the antigen that we were exposed to like a cousin of sorts so uh, so in that, we will also discuss the variants uh, of a virus uh, and how they affect the vaccine response. But again, that is something that we'll um, you know, cover in the later part of our presentation. So um, with that, uh, let's move on to the vaccine development and the phases of vaccine development. So next slide, please. So before we move on to the phases of vaccine development, let us understand what are the ingredients in a vaccine? So we firstly have the main ingredient in a vaccine, which is, uh, which is called the antigen, which is the key ingredient. It can either be a tiny part of the virus or it can be you know, an inactivated form of the virus or a blueprint from the virus that is going to train your body to respond to that particular disease. But that antigen is mixed with several other components as well. And these are called adjuvants and preservatives and stabilizers and surfactants and diluents. They each have their own role. And that role uh, is essential to um, ensuring the effectiveness of that particular vaccine. So, so it's, it's extremely important that we know that all of these, um, um, you know, um, parts of the uh, virus other than the key ingredient, which is the antigen, they have been in use for many, many decades. So we know what adjuvants and preservatives and stabilizers and surfactants do we need to make that vaccine delivery and administration and effectiveness the most robust. So it's not something new. 
uh, and again, because there is a lot of confusion about these particular components as well. Uh, so, uh, so I'm introducing these at this point in my presentation and we can cover the details of these in our um, Q&A later. So next slide, please. Can we move on to the next slide? Okay, so the vaccine development that we typically see is similar to what we see for nearly all drugs and biologics and devices and vaccines that we have in the world today. So any new product that is used to treat, prevent, or diagnose a disease is the result of a process of clinical trials. And that process uh, starts much before the clinical trials are started. So, so you have a population uh, that needs coverage from a vaccine, but you will start uh, that process in a lab. So uh, a particular group, it can be a commercial group, it can be a government entity, is going to identify a particular compound that shows some effectiveness in preventing a disease. Uh, and this stage is called the exploratory stage of vaccine development, because here we are only exploring a possible chemical that might be used as a vaccine. I think someone is unmuted and I um, is there a question? If there is a question, I, I would suggest that we keep this for the end. Um, uh, but yes, if there is a... But, they, can, sure. they can put the questions in the chat box if told them, please continue. Sure. So, uh, so the exploratory stage uh, uh, is usually restricted to a lab where you use these culture media and, um, and different uh, platforms to assess the possible effect that particular chemical has in preventing a particular disease. And that exploratory stage also um, includes the preclinical uh, testing in animals that have their genetic makeup closer to humans. Um, again, the purpose at this stage is to assess whether that particular vaccine has an effect uh, and whether we have enough safety information to enable us to test that particular vaccine in human beings as well. So there are th there's a lot of background work that happens before any company or any academic group would be allowed to test uh, vaccines in human beings. And it is also important and very worthwhile to mention here that of the hundreds of compounds that are tested as possible vaccine candidates, there are very few that go on from their exploratory and preclinical stage to their clinical development stage, because many um, compounds do not show enough uh, evidence for effectiveness uh, or, you know, or reasonable safety to enable us to test those in humans. So there are many things that stop at the exploratory and preclinical stage as well. Once we have sufficient data from this particular stage, we then move on to what is called the clinical development phase. And many of you might have heard of these phase one, two, and three clinical trials. Uh, and these, of course, are carried out in humans. Again, this is something that is carried out in a staged way. And here uh, I will stop and I will also address some of the key terms that many of you might have heard um, uh, during the, you know, the discussion um, that we have had uh, in, on social media and on various uh, news sources uh, related to COVID-19 vaccine. So there are certain concepts in clinical trials that are used. Firstly and foremostly, uh, clinical trial use a process of randomization. So randomization is essentially like flipping a coin. And its core purpose is to remove bias. Because if I am doing a research, if there is a candidate vaccine that I wish to develop, uh, I might be um, you know, too excited to um, remain objective in my assessment, or I might have um, a financial interest in its development, which might you know, reduce my objectivity. So there are scientific principles in place that ensure that that objectivity is retained. So one of that scientific principle is to use the process of randomization. Randomization ensures that the decision on who receives the drug or a vaccine in research studies is not dependent on me or you 
or anyone else for that matter. And that decision is taken objectively and through a defined process, which we all sometimes refer to as a randomization algorithm. The second concept that is often used in clinical trials is called blinding. So that is also one way to remove bias. So uh, if I know that I have not received a vaccine, but I've received a placebo, uh, it's possible that I might not uh, report any side effect because I will feel that, oh, I didn't receive a vaccine. So maybe this headache is probably not related to it. And I don't even need to you know, report it. And it's also possible that because I know that I've used an experimental vaccine, I might feel that every uh, little um, sensation in my entire body is related to that vaccine. So that over and under reporting and over and under assessment of the safety or efficacy in certain situations might be affected if I know what I've received or if as a researcher, I know what my patient has received. So to reduce that bias, the blinding process is used. The third core clinical concept is the concept of placebo. And there's a lot of misconception that goes around. Um, a placebo is a way that enables us to create two groups in a clinical trial. Uh, because for us to conclude that any effect that we have seen is only because of this drug, we need a comparison. And we, because it's possible that purely by chance, people who receive vaccine do not develop uh, COVID-19. So we need to compare that that effect is not purely because of chance. So we need a group that has not received the vaccine and we need to compare the results between the two. So often that comparator group is what we call is a placebo group. So what they receive is what is called a placebo. And a placebo is something that has no activity. It's an inert substance can be a sugar injection, it can be an empty virus shell, it can be anything that does not have a clinical effect. But placebo controlled trials are not the only way to do clinical trials and we can discuss this further in our discussion. So phase one is when you firstly test a vaccine in humans. It's usually done in limited people and in healthy people. And the aim is to find out the dose, the efficient delivery way and to assess the safety in humans reliably before you can test it in a larger group of people. And only once this is achieved and phase one can last anywhere between 12 to 18 months, would you be allowed by a regulatory authority to move on to phase two? It's important to know that the decision to move from animals to humans is not done by developers themselves. It's done by independent, uh, uh, robust, regulatory review processes. And I'm, you know, we can talk about those details in the later part of our presentation as well. So coming back to phase two, uh, so once we have sufficient data from phase one, you then move on to phase two. And phase two is when you increase the number of participants, uh, you, you make more emphasis on safety. These are often, um, unlike phase one, which are done on healthy individuals and are mostly open label in that, you know, often blinding is not used. Phase two uh, usually have comparative groups and they can be placebo controlled. So uh, once we have sufficient safety and um, you know, eff effective dose data from phase two studies, you then move on to phase three studies. And these are the make or break studies for a vaccine uh, because uh, it is this data that is going to lead to what we call is the, the regulatory approval of a vaccine or a drug. So phase three is usually done on hundreds of thousands of people. You want as much representation in the population as possible. You want safety, you want efficacy. Uh, and later on in our presentation, we can discuss the difference between assessing efficacy in a clinical trial versus the effectiveness in the real world. And it is only after all these phases are complete that you go for a approval via regulatory body for wider use. But it's also important for that for vaccines, the post approval uh, monitoring uh, and uh, an eye on their manufacturing and quality control, uh, it, it goes on. So, uh, so your job does not end once the, uh, the vaccine has received an approval. Uh, the safety data continues to be collected uh, and some eye needs to be kept on its good manufacturing and quality control practice as well. So next slide, please. So 
what happens uh, during a pandemic? Uh, we know that during a pandemic, uh, uh, while an average vaccine development can take anywhere between 12 to 15 years, this is not what has happened during COVID-19. And we have had vaccines available to us uh, in a matter of literally less than a year. So what happens differently and why is it done differently? Next slide, please. So before we, uh, we understand this, let's, let's, um, let's go back to the basics of understanding the COVID-19 virus. Uh, so uh, if you can click this. So firstly and foremostly, many of you might have seen this um, you know, crown-like picture of the virus. Um, without going into too many technical details, viruses usually are of two types. You have viruses that have their core components in the form of a DNA. And then you have viruses that have their core component in the form of an RNA. And the coronavirus uh, family is that second family of viruses. So their main uh, you know, genetic material is in the form of an RNA. Uh, they are, um, the RNA material is encapsulated in a protein and a lipid shell, and it is surrounded by what we call as the spike proteins. And it is the spike protein that is the focus of, um, you know, many vaccines, as well as um, the, um, uh, the, the PCR-based uh, testing that we do for the detection of the virus. So, um, and this structure uh, determines the target of the COVID-19 vaccines as well. So uh, if you can click on the next image also, please. So based on this structure, you can use uh, the, the whole or virus uh, in its live or inactivated form. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's RNA molecules, it's subunits, or, you know, or certain vectors that carry a part of the virus um, uh, to a particular person uh, using the vaccine modality. So next slide, please. So based on this, there would be three main approaches to making a vaccine that are, uh, that are also being used for the COVID-19 vaccine, using the whole virus uh, or its bacterium in its activated or inactivated forms, uh, using parts of the virus that trigger the immune system or just the genetic material of the virus. Next slide, please. So um, based on this understanding, there are currently four major types of uh, COVID-19 vaccines. Um, you have the whole virus vaccines. Um, currently, we don't have activated vaccines that are approved, uh, but some inactiv inactivated vaccines that are being developed and one that has been recently uh, approved as well. And then you have, um, because these are the kind of vaccines for which um, we have the most experience. Uh, so there is, um, there, is, um, there is the advantage of being able to, um, you know, use these very, very um, effectively. Uh, but then there is also certain disadvantages. And without going into too many details at the moment, what I will do is that I'll just um, briefly go through the main characteristics of these types. Uh, and we can later, in, in the later part of our presentation, we can discuss the advantages and disadvantages of uh, each type of vaccine. So, um, um, so with the whole virus vaccines um, in its inactivated form, uh, the, the, the main disadvantage is that um, uh, it, can, um, it can cause disease in people with a weak immune system. And secondly, they require very, um, you know, uh, special kind of cold storage, which makes their use challenging in uh, low socioeconomic um, uh, countries that are uh, low on the socioeconomic development index. So then you have protein subunit vaccines. Uh, they use um, fragments of the virus proteins to trigger an immune response. So it minimizes the risk of side effects, but it also means that the immune response might not be as robust. Um, so you, you need ways to boost the immune response, um, which is uh, you know, currently being done for these particular kind of vaccines. And then you have these nucleic acid vaccines. 
uh, which uh, which are you know um, either DNA or RNA based vaccines. So currently, the RNA vac vaccines that are being used, everyone is aware of. Uh, the most um, the most critical uh, point uh, in their development has been that we didn't have any approved RNA vaccines when these vaccines were developed. So our experience with this particular platform is really limited, except for some, uh, you know, cancer vaccines that were under development. Uh, and it is this what has led people to uh, have a certain kind of reluctance to their acceptability and a certain kind of uh, suspicion with their rapid development as well. And again, they need ultra cold temperatures for their storage and delivery, which can be challenging. And then finally, we have uh, viral vector vaccines. Um, what they do is that um, uh, they differ from nucleic acid vaccines because they use a harmless virus different from the virus that we are trying to target. So, so for instance, um, we are all familiar with the CanSino um, uh, vaccine that is being um, tested currently via trials in Pakistan right now as well. Uh, so it uses an adenovirus and adeno, the adenovirus is, is, the, is the common cold virus that we have all been exposed to. So this is used as a vector, as a vehicle to, you know, to induce an immune response in our body. But the challenge is that because many people might already be exposed to this virus, uh, the, the immune response may not be as robust. So um, with this background in mind, let's try and see how were we really able to develop uh, vaccines, COVID-19 vaccines in a very, very rapid way during this pandemic and why did we need to do so? So uh, can we move on to the next slide, please? So um, this slide may, may appear busy and complex, uh, but essentially uh, it compares the traditional paradigm, which I've just explained, which take, of vaccine development, which takes several years, and the outbreak paradigm, uh, which has overlapping phases resulting in a shortened development time. It's important to know that um, this is not something that was developed in the span of last one year. Over the past decade, the scientific community has actually, and the vaccine industry, has responded urgently to various other pandemics, uh, epidemics as well. It included the H1N1 influenza epidemic, the Ebola, the Zika viruses, um, and um, you know the the SARS and MERS um, outbreaks that were you know from the same family. Uh, of the current coronavirus. And what happened was that vaccines for SARS and Ebola and Zika, they followed a traditional path. Um, and the epidemics ended before the vaccine development was complete. Um, whereas the H1N1 influenza vaccine was developed relatively rapidly, largely because the vaccine uh, technology was developed. So, um, this experience had taught that we need novel development and manufacturing modalities to develop vaccines robustly. So uh, many organizations across the world were already developing technologies and modalities to fast deliver and manufacture a vaccine for a disease X already. So our capacity to uh, rapidly respond to urgent um, clinical trial initiation for an outbreak was already there. And secondly, um, there is a outbreak paradigm in place that has several overlapping phases. So in an outbreak, you don't wait for phase one data to collate and to be reviewed and approved before you move on to phase two because you want to uh, robustly uh, but quickly generate um, evidence that is going to um, protect a large chunk of your population. So this in a nutshell, and while that development is ongoing, manufacturing and you know, commercialization um, and access decisions are taken simultaneously. And this is what has been done in this current pandemic. And, and this is the reason why we have ended up 
uh, with, uh, you know, a set of vaccines very, very um, quickly. Uh, I, I see that there are questions related to go, no go criteria, and I, I plan to cover these in the later part of my presentation. And we can discuss these, these in detail in our discussion as well. Next slide, please. So, uh, so what this has done is that uh, this has enabled us to, um, so um, um, about a uh, you know, week or 10 days back, and this is the data from the WHO uh, database for COVID-19 uh, vaccines, at least seven different vaccines using various platforms have been rolled out in different countries. Uh, with a uh, priority being given to the vulnerable population in different countries. Uh, and there are hundreds of vaccines that are in preclinical development phase and many um, uh, more than 70 that are currently in the clinical development phase. Um, uh, and, and as I mentioned in the earlier part of my presentation, the, the need to develop so many vaccines together is A, to ensure coverage of as many parts of the globe as possible quickly. And also because we know that many uh, chemicals that are being uh, you know, uh, currently explored via preclinical development and clinical development might not go on to you know, become actual vaccines. Uh, at the same time, uh, there, are, there, are, there are organizations and facilities uh, set up in conjunction with WHO and philanthropic organizations and governments across the world that are aiming to end the acute phase of the pandemic by not just speeding up the development of these vaccines, but also supporting the building of manufacturing capabilities and working with governments to ensure fair and equitable allocation of these vaccines and access to these vaccines as quickly as possible. Um, next slide, please. So once you have developed uh, a certain set of vaccines, what happens next? Uh, as we discussed earlier, you go for their regulatory reviews and approvals, uh, and then you need to manufacture and distribute these and ensure their quality control as well. Um, a common terminology that has been used very, very frequently is the emergency use authorization. It's important to remember that an emergency use authorization is something that is used in an outbreak setting, and it is different from a final approval and licensure. So the vaccines that have currently received emergency use authorizations continue to be tested in clinical trials. Their clinical trials are still ongoing, but what they have received, uh, and this is based on you know, robust, uh, reliable data on their safety and effectiveness, is um, a preliminary license for their use in populations that need it at, you know, immediately and um, um, and very, very urgently. So next slide, please. So there are conditions for this emergency use approval as well. Uh, uh, an emergency use approval is, a, uh, is usually a terminology that Pakistan's regulatory authorities and uh, larger regulatory authorities such as the FDA use, uh, but there are several other emergency use processes across the world as well, including, including the emergency use listing by the WHO, and they use you know, their own specific criteria. But largely, most emergency use authorization focus on uh, you know, about three or four criteria. Firstly, they need analysis, or either the final analysis of a phase three efficacy trial or an interim analysis that, um, and an interim analysis is usually something that is done um, while a trial is ongoing. This is not the final analysis, this is an analysis that is done um, on an ongoing basis to ensure that the trial that we are doing uh, continues to be safe for our trial participants while we are collecting data. So the interim analysis needs to uh, come from a reasonable number of participants uh, and, um, um, and it, it needs to have um, a certain minimum um, duration of follow-up uh, that needs to happen. So in case of COVID-19 studies, the minimum duration was set at at least two months. 
and then um, uh, there are certain number of participants that are also expected. So uh, a minimum safety database from at least 3000 vaccine participants from a phase three trial it is what is required. And finally, and most importantly, there are criteria uh, for efficacy and safety that are also, you know, thresholds that are considered acceptable. And those thresholds are set fairly high. So unlike a, a, a cancer drug that might receive an approval if it's just leading to a 5% effectiveness, a vaccine um, uh, is, is required to demonstrate at least a 50% um, you know, risk reduction um, uh, of developing, for instance, COVID-19 before it will receive approval. And most of the vaccines that have currently, uh, all vaccines that have currently re received their emergency use authorizations actually have much more than 50% effectiveness. And at the same time, uh, regulatory authorities also evaluate, you know, the, the chemistry and manufacturing and quality controls uh, of the manufacturer's ability to produce and distribute, uh, you know, a quality vaccine. So next slide, please. So we now move on to the last part of our presentation, which is, you know, another burning question that people have, which is that, um, so we have vaccines that are approved. How are they um, rolled out uh, across the world in a way that uh, it is um, safe and fair for everyone. So um, I think one of the most um, remarkable things about this pandemic is that everyone understands that it won't end if we just, um, you know, um, if we just act selfishly. So, so the whole world has um, catched on to this fairly quickly. Uh, and they have all uh, come together via a series of various alliances. So one of the biggest alliances that matters to us, especially in Pakistan, is the COVAX facility and the COVAX advanced market commitment. So COVAX is essentially COVID-19 vaccine global access facility, which was developed by WHO in collaboration with uh, several coalitions that were working to uh, ensure uh, access for vaccines um, uh, uh, that need to reach lower middle income countries as well. So, so they will ensure that uh, the procurement and equitable distribution of vaccine happens to all nations, regardless of their income level. Uh, and for that, this facility works to work with, uh, you know, high income countries, uh, and requires them to place orders for vaccine manufacturing um, even while their development is ongoing. And, um, and they prepare lower, lower middle income countries to receive that particular vaccine as best as they can. This is in a nutshell what this COVAX facility and the advanced market commitment um, you know, hopes to achieve. And for that, they have a whole plan of country readiness and delivery, um, because many lower middle income countries do not have the required resources to even receive, store or distribute that vaccines before they can reach to their um, required population. Another very important part of this facility is to also ensure that uh, the, the people who need this vaccine the most receive this the earliest. So there are phases of rollout that are being followed globally uh, using this particular facility and its um, uh, ventures across the world. Next slide, please. So this country readiness and delivery plans essentially enables lower middle income countries like us to prepare ourselves for our national deployment and vaccination plans prepare our regulatory bodies, uh, identify costs and fundings that will be required, identify the target populations that we will be targeting first and the delivery strategies for those, uh, and streamline the supply and logistics and um, the funding that we will need to upgrade the supply and logistics. Uh, there are several other aspects of this as well. Again, I won't go into the specific details and if needed, we can cover these in our discussion. 
so next slide please so this in a nutshell has what has you know uh, so far been done to enable across the globe access to vaccine delivery and as you can see um, uh, just um, uh, you know uh, two months into having received um, the first EUAs the world um, is not doing um, I wouldn't say the world is doing good but it's not doing too bad in terms of the north versus south coverage uh, so certainly the north part of the globe is better covered um, but um, at least that coverage there's a, there's a way to ensure that that coverage happens and i'll end here um, and um, we can you know start taking the questions i can see that there are already some in the chat uh, and we can start taking these one by one thank you Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Mariam, for uh, that uh, presentation. So uh, uh, your presentation was very insightful and informative. We already, yes, as you noticed, a lot of burning questions that have appeared on the chat box. So we're just going to take them one by one. Uh, so from uh, uh, Tahira Abdullah, we have who makes the decision for for the for, for vaccination. What is the criteria? Okay, so it's done at several levels, actually. So even when a candidate vaccine needs to be developed further via clinical development, uh, there are criteria that regulatory bodies and bodies such as the World Health Organization have established. Um, and these criteria need to be met uh, before the vaccine can go further. And then there are, um, you know, there are criteria, uh, as I outline, you know, outline the criteria for emergency use authorizations. These are these are the result of series of expert consultations and a review of existing data. So there, there is a there's a process in place for the for the approvals as well. These are not random decisions that are taken just to ensure that some approvals are in place. Uh, lastly and foremostly, once you have these emergency use authorizations, uh, the criteria for allocation, who receives uh, the vaccine and who does not, are also based on uh, the scientific need as well as our, uh, the, the ethical principle of covering the vulnerable population firstly and foremostly. So, so one of the one of the populations, for instance, that has been identified are the healthcare workers, uh, that they they should receive the vaccine first. So this is not just um, you know, um, this is not just um, uh, this is not just the result of us um, uh, uh, you know um, giving a prize to the healthcare workers because they had risked their lives earlier. Uh, this is also the result of the fact that healthcare workers are at the most risk and also because they get exposed to several different variants of the virus most frequently and hence are more likely to be the petri dishes for more virus mutations. So, so there's a reason why this group has been identified as, as one of the groups that needs, needs this vaccine at the earliest. Uh, and the and one of the uh, one of the core decisions taken by, for instance, the Covax facility is that, firstly, these high risk groups, the the elderly, uh, and the healthcare providers. Um, so so the aim is to firstly cover these groups, and then move on to those groups that uh, such as the asylum seekers and the refugees who will not otherwise get access. Um, and then move on to a large scale rollout across the countries. I hope this answers your question. Okay, uh, so. So, uh, uh, connection with that, Dr. Mariam, if I may, Ikram Brahim has asked a question because it kind of relates to the other question that was asked earlier. Uh, if I may, Yes. So um, there's a lot of global discussion on, you know, preparing and engaging with communities in advance of vaccination. Um, because um, I mentioned the, the pandemic of misinformation that has been, you know, 
the nemesis uh, for um, for all kinds of preventive strategies that we need for this particular um, um, virus. The issue is that um, since the day that this pandemic has started throughout the world, uh, most of the strategies have been thrust onto communities with little dialogue, and that communities include healthcare workers. Uh, so, um, and again, that's a personal opinion, but I believe that without engaging in uh, or getting into or trying to understand why that lack of trust exists, we will never be able to improve the uptake of vaccines. And uh, bodies such as the WHO uh, and the COVAX and their related COVAX facilities and other vaccine alliances, they all recommend that you provide the right kind of information to your uh, to your community, uh, including you know all um, targets of vaccine, um, you know target groups that will be receiving the vaccines, and you address the misconceptions that exist. Before we started the session, we were um, discussing um, the fact that you know there's a, there's a certain connotation that is attached to the Chinese uh, you know products. And the same sentiment uh, is attached to the Chinese vaccine as well, which have shown reasonable efficacy and safety so far. So, um, so it's a sentiment; it's there. And unless and until we engage in dialogue and you know and share um, data that can dispel such myths in a way that is palatable for our population uh, and doesn't become scientific jargon for them, uh, we will not be able to deal with this. And, and it's, it's, it's very important to remember that even healthcare workers, um, all healthcare workers would not understand, um, you know, confidence intervals and um, efficacy thresholds. It's important to, yes. Uh, uh, Dr. Mariam, thank you for a good talk. Uh, connected to this, exactly what you're saying, I think, and uh, I put a comment on, there has been a certain push to get vaccines on, on the road, and I think that's a good push, except there's a commercial aspect behind it also. Now, if pandemics are a public health issue, the public health issue is some of the things that you're talking about, which is public health education, getting processes done ahead of time. So I think one of the things that has happened is that in the push for vaccines, that aspect has completely been lost. Um, it, it, there is, if, if we need to move to another question, if you don't mind. Um, somebody, and this is something that a lot of people do want to ask. So Dr. Kidvai wants to know which vaccine is safe for those who are over 60 years of age. Okay, thank you. Uh, so currently what has happened is that um, most of the candidates that are being developed because, and, and this is again, this is something that is done routinely for vaccines. Uh, so, so for instance, if a vaccine is needed for children, you will first test this on adults and bring the age criteria increasingly down before you can, you know, start testing children. Uh, a similar approach has been used for COVID-19 vaccine development. So most of the trials started off with a younger population and a population that wasn't entirely at risk of developing COVID-19 and then moved on to a more representative population. So what has happened is that for most of the clinical trial data that we have available, roughly 10 to 15 percent of the current um, you know, um, vaccines, at least the ones that are approved in Pakistan, have, uh, you know, people above 60 who have been evaluated. So, so currently we have about 10 to 12 percent people um, in the CanSino trial that are uh, in the above 60 group. We know that the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine has also you know, evaluated safety and efficacy in the higher age group. We know that this has not been the case in the Sinopharm uh, vaccine. That is why the approval was restricted to those under 60, uh, because that data, um, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's still being reviewed by the Vaccine Expert Committee of DRAP. Wow. So, uh, so, so not all candidates. And, huh? um, and again, I've, I've restricted my answer to the options that are available in Pakistan currently via an emergency use authorizations. 
uh, and yes, commenting on Dr. Uh, Muazzam's comment, absolutely, uh, vaccines are a part of the preventive strategy. And even when we have been vaccinated, the, the other public health preventive measures continue to play a very crucial role in the virus spread and its containment. Uh, Dr. Mariam, so a couple of questions which are related to and which oh, are Dr. Uh, Dr. Mariam, uh, uh, these are all linked to the safety of, uh, the, uh, of, the, of the vaccines. So from Sayyid Azhar Abbas Delhi, hello, wanted to know if the vaccine, the global corona virus inactivated vaccine, Euro Cell from Eastern Institute of Biological Products, holds the safe reliable vaccine. These are being given out to the office staff members in my father's office, and, and I was curious if they were legitimate and safe. So this is, uh, I would like to add that um, this is uh, the vaccine that is being given in Pakistan right now. This is... Um, the, um, the the only one, uh, the Sinopharm, is comes with on in this name. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. So yes. it is the same. So it is the same vaccine that is actually in all over the country. So there was some confusion as to this. It, it says Verocell, while as whereas the the term that is coming in newspapers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is Sinopharm. So, but they are the same entity. So, in, yes. so the question is from uh, the gentleman, is this okay? Because this is being offered in his office. Okay. So, um, so let me um, answer your question this way. So currently, uh, we have an emergency use authorization for this, which essentially means that the available data uh, from phase three studies, which are meant to assess the safety and um, efficacy, which is, you know, the ability of the vaccine to prevent disease. Uh, uh, it lies, uh, uh, it, it, uh, it completes the required thresholds that were needed for this. Uh, so for vaccines, uh, generally the understanding is that if the interim data shows a reliable safety and efficacy, they are good to go. But there are two very important considerations. Uh, firstly, the data continues, you know, there's a need for continued monitoring of this data because you have not have the final say on this yet. And this is done via two different mechanisms. One is continued trials for that particular, um, um, you know, a vaccine candidate. Um, because you do need 12 to 24 months safety and efficacy data, uh, which currently does not exist for these particular compounds. And secondly, you also need the real world effectiveness and safety data. And that is only possible through reliable adverse event reporting systems. And it is probably this aspect that uh, is not, um, I would say, um, you know, robustly covered, uh, at least in countries like Pakistan, because while developed countries have a robust adverse event reporting system, uh, it may have its own limitations, but uh, um, it, it, it's not, uh, you know, that, of, you know, uh, it might exist on paper, but it's not something that even those administering vaccines use very regularly. Uh, so uh, so the, the concern is that if safety signals emerge, uh, after these emergency use authorizations, they might be missed. But as far as current available data goes, uh, yes, there is reliable safety and efficacy information for this particular vaccine. Okay, so, yeah, so Dr. two questions uh, uh, from Hadi Laza is, is COVID vaccine safe in children? And if yes, which one? And then I think linked to that is that how, how long do the body, antibodies last after you get vac vaccinated? Okay, so, so currently what is happening is that um, uh, the, the focus of, uh, you know, most vaccine trial has not been children because you need demonstrated safety and efficacy in adults before you can, you know, uh, bring it down to um, younger age groups. So what most um, uh, vaccine developers have started doing is that they have started exploring uh, its safety in increasingly younger groups. But currently we don't have approvals for, um, or even reliable safety and efficacy data for COVID-19 vaccines in children. Uh, one of the um, 
one of the reasons why many drugs and vaccines often, um, and this is especially true for drugs, uh, they are not, um, I mean, uh, they are not explored adequately in children and in pregnant women is because, um, you know, the, the required safety nets that are required for such populations are very, very stringent. So they, they are often um, orphaned in the sense during the regulatory process. So again, that's a, that's a long debate and coming back to your question, currently we don't have uh, adequate data for vaccination safety in children. Um, but uh, the second question, uh, I think I forgot the second question. What, uh, the second That's question. Correct. So second question was related to how, how long do the antibodies last after the first dose of vaccination? Okay. So you get the second dose. So, so most of the vaccines that we have currently follow a two dose schedule. You know, they require multiple doses, more than one dose, except for the CanSino vaccine, which requires a single dose currently. But it might change um, because the sponsors do have, you know, an adaptive design, so they, they could change this. So, so what happens is that um, though there is some, uh, you know, the, the current research has alluded to some response, even after the first dose, the assessments that have been done related to antibody response or their effectiveness, uh, efficacy in preventing uh, COVID-19, uh, it has been assessed after the second dose. And that response is el elicited usually about four weeks after the second dose. Two to four weeks, it varies uh, from one candidate to another. So it starts from that point in time. So there is a window between the first and second dose and even after the second dose when you might not essentially be protected. Uh, and it is possible for you to catch COVID-19 during that window uh, and even later because no vaccine is providing 100% efficacy. Um, and that uh, response currently uh, has only been evaluated for a you know, few months. Uh, the aim is to have data for 12 to 24 months, eventually, via the ongoing phase three clinical trials. And it is that data which is going to tell us whether we will need annual boosters or boosters every two years or biannual boosters. So, so that information is currently in development. Mariam, one of the questions also is for those who have actually suffered from COVID-19. So Dr. Asad wants to know what would be the, the, what is the recommended thing for them as far as vaccination is concerned? Okay, so uh, there are three things for that. Firstly, those who have active COVID-19 obviously would not be vaccinated. They will need to complete their quarantine and all that. Secondly, while there is no um, contraindication to receiving the vaccine once they have recovered from COVID-19, it is recommended that uh, they should wait a while because they will have their natural antibodies as well. Um, so, um, and, and, and it's uh, the... The assumption is that um, they might develop more severe side effects uh, because of the robust immune response that their might, body might uh, evoke as a result of that added vaccination. So there are some who suggest that they should wait at least four weeks, and there are some that suggest that waiting um, even three to four months is something that can be considered. All right. Uh, so a follow-up question by uh, Sayyar Azhar about, about the idea is that is zero cell safe for people with high blood pressure and diabetes? Okay. So there are, um, uh, there is limited data uh, of vaccine safety uh, in those who have pre-existing health conditions. And the reason is that uh, phase three clinical trials have largely focused on a um, largely healthy population. But because we did have phase three trials that did enroll participants um, above um, you know, 60 years of age, some pre-existing baseline comorbids were expected in this population. But because clinical trials only so far have enrolled those whose, who've, whose baseline health conditions were well under control, um, this will, you know, this we will have to rely on clinician judgment on what they feel is uh, safe and suitable for their, um, uh, you know, uh, people for now and from, you know, the 
the vaccine rollout data that we will be receiving um, from various countries. Uh, because currently, um, in all honesty, uh, the existing data, um, uh, although it does not, it has not, you know, really identified any major safety signals for those with asthma or diabetes or cardiovascular disease, but then uh, these trials weren't really focusing on this particular population per se anyway. So, if there are any more questions, uh, we have a couple of more minutes to take them. Not that will be. Yeah, there is there is one suggestion from uh, Doctor uh, Kidwai, which is uh, uh, to perhaps have another session on the effect of COVID on business management and whether <laughs> that can be organized well. Send us your comments, and if there are more areas in uh, related to COVID vaccine, we'll be very happy to put something together. Because as um, Dr. Mariam has pointed out, one of the things that has been missing, certainly in Pakistan and also in other countries, is not sufficient information has been provided to the public. And that's the public health part of it. You, can, you can't uh, force people uh, to, I think that would be a disaster. If you brought in punitive measures uh, that people have to go get themselves vaccinated or they lose their jobs, et cetera, et cetera. That's perhaps the worst thing that could possibly happen. And that'll uh, bring an end to trying to get vaccines around in Pakistan. So send us your comments, et cetera. We'll be very happy to set up more stuff together uh, if there are specific areas that you need discussed. Just one more uh, question from Dr. Naimar. Is there any, are there any reported complications of this vaccine? And I'm assuming that the Chinese vaccine that we're talking about yet in Pakistan. Um, okay, so uh, I presume that uh, Dr. Naima is asking about the currently approved vaccines. So, um, uh, so currently the available data suggests that um, we have so far seen um, uh, two kinds of effects. One are, you know, the, the local effects, injection site pain and, um, you know, um, any inflammation or, um, and stuff like that. And then some systemic effects such as fever or body aches and pains or headaches and myalgias and stuff like that. These are, these are the commonest things that you expect after vaccination anyway. Uh, and most of these uh, have been either self-limiting or those that limited, uh, uh, those that resolved with, um, you know, some symptomatic treatment. Uh, we have not, uh, uh, at least to the best of my knowledge, uh, received uh, reports of uh, uh, many serious adverse events that were linked to the vaccine as well, because one of the um, safety mechanisms that is followed in a clinical trial is when uh, you know, trials focus on collecting data on serious adverse events. And these are those kind of side effects that lead to hospitalization or a death uh, or a very medically significant event. Uh, and their second focus is to collect data on medically attended events. Uh, that, uh, that focus is kept because the aim is to identify a safety signal that might allude to uh, a major problem with that vaccine quickly. Uh, because we are not worried about these, you know, mild side effects of pain or fever. We are more worried about missing something that might harm somebody who receives that vaccine. So, uh, again, the available data has uh, pointed to some reports of, uh, uh, I think I saw one report of a GB syndrome, gullin barre syndrome, uh, yesterday uh, that was linked to the um, uh, CanSino vaccine. Uh, there, there have been some reports of anaphylaxis, which is a severe form of allergic reaction, but the number has been very low. So, so far uh, of the, and usually what we do is that uh, this number is collated uh, for the number of, you know, million participants that have received that particular thing. So that number has been very low and limited. So maybe um, the Moderna vaccine, for instance, showed uh, 2.5 uh, anaphylaxis events in 100,000 people who received that particular vaccine. So, uh, 
so because that number has been low for serious adverse events so far, uh, it seems that um, uh, we have not received serious safety signals as yet. Um, and, and this is why we have thousands of patients enrolling in a vaccine as well. Because this is something that is being used in healthy individuals, individuals who have not caught a disease, chances are that a rare side effect might be missed. Mm -hmm. So, so for instance, if, uh, you know, if, uh, if, if it's possible that anaphylaxis will occur in one in thousand people, you will need uh, thousands, 10,000 or maybe 60,000 people to detect that particular uh, risk. So that is why the sample size of these vaccine trial also runs in many thousands. Uh, because you need uh, uh, you need to be able to detect these rare side effects. Again, I would say that uh, the large sample size and their design enabling collection of this data helps us uh, as far as the design of the trial goes. But these trials have not moved that far advanced in their safety data collection for us to conclusively say that there is no major safety risk. Uh, but because mostly vaccines, uh, show their risks, uh, I mean, risks associated with vaccine delivery are mostly short term. Uh, most of the vaccines that are currently being used for various diseases, um, most of their uh, side effects were, you know, short term. So okay. it would be reasonable to say that the limited safety data that we have uh, alludes to some reasonable safety. Okay, so just one last question now that's just come up and after that we can close the session. So is monitoring for side effects centralized for a safety monitoring board or is it, is it left to the institution? That's what Dr. Tashmin and Okay, this is a very good question. Um, and the response would vary uh, across the world. So um, while a trial is ongoing, an independent um, data and safety monitoring board, which is independent of the you know trial sponsors, is supposed to review the data. Uh, the safety data and give the no-go decisions, the go-no-go -no -go decisions for continuation of that trial. That is done at a specific research study level. But once a vaccine has received, um, you know, um, an emergency use authorization or a licensure, regulatory bodies, the robust regulatory bodies such as the FDA, have their own um, vaccine adverse event collecting systems. Uh, even vaccine um, manufacturers such as pharmaceutical okay. companies also have their own platforms because it's in their interest to collect this data uh, to identify safety signals in a timely way. So, but uh, this, is, uh, this is a mechanism yeah. that is lacking in many lower middle income countries. Uh, and one of the uh, one of the um, one of the ways via which WHO is uh, at least trying to you know um, cater to this deficiency uh, is to uh, is to develop regulatory bodies from LMICs in that regard as well. Uh, how successful have we all been in that regard is something that I really don't. Uh, I think everyone knows the status on that. So I think we're done with the question. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mariam. Yes, and, and before we end, actually, I would like to congratulate Dr. Mariam on, on behalf of CBEX behalf also for becoming a panelist in the WHO's elite consultation for uh, uh, COVID-19 therapy. So that's a great honor for you, Mariam, and for the country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. For the office. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks for joining me. You are welcome to email us your comments.